Kaya, if someone has been on one career path or has had one life calling, let's say, and they decide they want to change course, what's your advice to them? We saw so many people in the pandemic realize life is short and you've got to follow your passion. You've got to do what you love. You've got to do what lights you up. And so a lot of folks have circled back to, well, what is my calling? What was in my heart when I was a teenager in my 20s? Maybe I gave up that path. Um, and then certainly the young people who maybe feel even more ambitious than ever about, I don't want to compromise. I want to go after what really is important to me. So my best advice is to take every advantage that you can give yourself going into the entertainment business, going into Hollywood. Um, my own personal regret bring, oh, I wish I went to law school. <laughs> I was a development exec, but oh my gosh, had I gone to law school and had some comprehension of contracts going in, I would have been so much better positioned. And so those types of decisions, okay, this is my calling. I really want to work above the line, writer, director, showrunner, producer. How could you arm yourself? What advantages could you give yourself? Living in Los Angeles is an advantage. Living in New York is an advantage. Making sure you have a great Wi-Fi connection in your house so that your Zoom calls don't drop off if you're taking meetings outside the business because we have opened up virtually now to folks who are not living in the major epicenters of the industry. So looking at your life that way, how could I give myself more advantages? One of the biggest advantages you can think about giving yourself is what I call finding your wolf pack. Who are the others who could partner with you, who you just, you love to breathe their air. They excite you creatively. Maybe you admire their writing or you admire their filmmaking or just somebody that makes you laugh and you get along with them and like, oh my gosh, they just always crack me up. Great, partner with them. What could you work on together? Maybe you could even do a short film together, work on getting a feature together. That is something that the industry always relates to and responds to. Oh, partnership. This team of people are doing this. And when there's an energy around it, that can be a big draw, especially for buyers who go, oh, that's interesting. Producer goes, oh, this has some momentum. Uh, and that can really help you, those types of advantages. What is reframing failure and how have you implemented this in your life? Failure is a topic that up until recent times has just really been taboo. You might feel ashamed. You've had some failures and you don't want to admit that to anyone or maybe your family has even come down on you like, oh, we expected better from you. So then we internalize those voices and then we can even turn against ourselves. So how do you reframe failure? Well, it's important to realize that all the most successful people, whether you're talking about Elon Musk or Michael Jordan or Margaret Atwood, they have had significant failures in their lives and in their past that has built their character, built their drive, taught them, oh, I shouldn't go that way. I should go this way. I get better results if I do that. And then so normalizing failure for us, oh, it's an experiment. For myself, even in my business or in my own writing, I always say, this is an experiment then it's like, oh, if it completely burns to the ground, okay, well, that experiment didn't work out. Let's try a new experiment. So it lowers the pressure. It doesn't have to just be a success and knock it out of the park all the time because then that ends up becoming a burden of pressure that you put on yourself. So that's one way that I recommend navigating failures through your own self-talk. This is an experiment. I'm going to try this. I'm going to try that. And then it can be playful and fun. The entertainment industry really loves people who are bringing in joy and fun and a sense of what I call in the entertainment business school, awesomeness. Just be awesome. Bring awesomeness. And then people go, what's happening over there with you? You know, and they want to get to know you because you bring in your best self, your best spirit. But failure is part of the business across the board. There are failures. I mean, when I was a development exec, we had movies that didn't do well at the box office. And we had to process that and go, okay, well, if we, if we invested in that, we all believed in that and it didn't work out. Well, can we learn from that so we can make a better decision next time? And we would have those debrief meetings. So if there's anyone in your life that you can debrief with who you trust, who is part of your wolf pack, who could say, let's Let's reframe the failure for yourself as something that you learned 
that is a mistake you won't make again so that you can get the lesson and then make a different mistake next time. Because I think the biggest failure that any of us could have is making the same mistake over and over. That's the kind of truest failure, but if you actually make a mistake, things go sideways, you learn from it, then you get to make a new mistake next time. And then you can start to feel like your own growth as a human being is tied to your creative path. And I think that that's the best any of us can hope for. It's important to remember Leonardo da Vinci was not famous in his lifetime. He was passed over for the Sistine Chapel. He was a gay man who was imprisoned for sodomy, who couldn't even live his best life out in public, and he was discovered 100 years after he died. So I'm a historian, if you look back through history, you go, oh my gosh, there are so many incredible examples of artists who were recognized long after they passed because they left legacy, they left something of value. So if you have decided, this is my calling, this is my path, Stay really close to your muse, to your inner voice that says, how can I be, give something back? How can I give something back to others, to the world, through my art? And you kind of have to let it go. Knowing um, one of my producing partners says, it's better to have too many babies than a spoiled baby. So you don't necessarily get to know, oh, I hope this project goes, but you don't really know if it will go. You can hope and hope and pray. But if you have a few projects, then you have more of a chance of knowing, okay, that one failed, that one failed. Oh, but this one did really well. Well, you had said too that someone gave you the advice that the entertainment industry loves people who are busy, pretty, and forgive me, I forgot the other one. Happy, but, busy, pretty. Okay, happy, busy, pretty. What if someone says, well, that's not in my nature? <clears throat> How can we sort of present that even though once they get to know us, they find out we actually do great work? So that's a quote that's a little out of context. Let me give you the context. My friend Juliet Lando and I are always joking about and laughing that this industry only wants you to look happy, busy, and pretty all day, every day. You can't let any of the warts show. And that's not human, but yet if you go back through film history, it's glamour and it's optics and it's image and all these things. So there's a lot of challenges to living in our modern times today, but one of the beautiful, maybe silver linings to all the challenges that we face is that we do get to be a bit more real. And I think we're all craving feeling like someone is real. Think about the show that you watched most recently that you really, really loved. There's probably a character from that show that was real. That somehow, whether they were funny or more dramatic, they felt so real to you and alive and like someone you might even wanna be friends with. And I think at the end of the day, that's what we're all craving. That's what execs are craving. That's what showrunners want to staff in their rooms. You might be watching Star Trek and it's completely, you know, it's genre and it's sci-fi and it's other worlds. But then you realize, oh, but I love Dr. Crusher. I love Picard. These are people who I wish I could know in real life. And because there's resonance, because it feels real, audiences tune in. That's what we want. We want to feel something. We want to laugh. We want to cry. We want to connect. So being happy, busy, pretty, even though this industry is like, we just want you to do that. It actually is full of real people. Execs are real people. They're like, tell me your story. What do you want me to know about you? And this is what really will help you in your career is getting in touch with your realness. Who are you that you can really bring forward? Go to the depths, we say like right from your marrow. You know, if, if an actor is really embodied, they're bringing something real. It's not just gloss. And I think that's what audiences crave, long for, want to connect with. We're wanting to get past the, the faux image and get to something deeper and real. Think about a hit like The, the Bear which was almost a little bit of a sleeper hit. Like they didn't have a huge budget at the beginning in their first season, but by season two, so much realness. The audiences are going, oh my God, this is, the writing is incredible. And I feel like I know these people and I want to know these people. And they really penetrated a much bigger audience, I think for that quality that they were bringing through the screen. And if using that example, again, this is not a show about happy, busy, and pretty. 
This is a show about real, about here's the scars, here's the wounds, here's the crazy relationships. And we're all, I think, longing for that coming out of a horrific pandemic. And then in the entertainment business, the strikes and the work stoppages, which were also painful for so many of us and for my students as well, that we're all going, how can we build something better? Um, how can we build something that feels more real to all of us that's more fun, hopefully? Because if you're being fake, you're not having fun. That's just the truth of it. But if you're being real, you're gonna make real connections, real connections with your own wolf pack and also with your audience. And as you grow your career, that's who you want to have, you know, in the ripple effect of your creative works. It's like, oh, the audience who I have fans and they love what I did. An example I use and teach from in the entertainment business school is Mystery Science Theater 3000 and Joel Hodgson. And you know, I grew up in my teen years watching these silly robots and this ventriloquist make jokes about these B movies and we would just laugh and laugh. And he developed such a huge fan base that people were like, oh, we love him. It's so creative. It's so real. It's so funny. And you would never expect like an exec if you were pitching. I'm gonna pitch you a show with a ventriloquist and a couple of robots and we're gonna make jokes about B-movies. I don't know many execs who'd be like, oh yeah, let's green light that, <laughs> you know? But that, when he's coming from that real place that Joel Hodgson was as a creator, huge fan base, real connection.